four, because there'd be four interacting components um, for in every case. Um, but in fact, if you make up design structure matrices at random, what you find is they're typically bottleneck components, and D is heterogeneous and more complicated to compute. Uh, and progress occurs via a sequence of punctuated equilibria. So I'll show you a picture of the computer one, just to illustrate this. So here we have the number of dark throws down here, the number of turns. So we're talking evolutionary time. Notice this is 10 to the 16. So we you know, kept the computers warm for a little while to do this. And here's the design structure matrix. So we have seven components in this device. And so everything always interacts with itself. But in addition, we have some off-diagonal interactions. And we then simulated this. And we have, so we have two, simula two specific simulated runs as well as a whole ensemble of runs uh, simulated with diff you know, just different random number seeds. And what we show is that, first of all, here's the predicted rate of decrease. So we're following, you can see the envelope follows that quite clearly. Um, and though there is some range, there's actually quite a lot of diversity in how fast things improve. And if you look at specific runs, though, you see something kind of interesting. That is, there's a period at the beginning where things come down fairly gradually. Then you get in, later on, they come down in steps. And um, so these steps get longer and longer. And, um, and what's happening here, it turns out, is that these, what happens is a bottleneck component slows progress down. So everything else has improved as much as it can without seeing an improvement in the bottleneck component. Then the bottleneck component finally improves. And then there's a, this is not one step. There's a sequence of innovations that drive this down, and then you get stuck in another plateau. Interesting example where punctuated equilibrium comes out of an extremely simple model. Um, now, so I think, as I said, I think it's a nice start. It's a nice model, but it's really only part of the story. And in particular, what's clear is that innovations in one industry often drive innovations in others. This has been seen in lots of case studies. And so really, if you want to think about how technologies are improving, you can't think about an individual technology. You have to think about the whole ecosphere of technologies, because an improvement in one domain, like um, semiconductors, can first can percolate throughout lots of domains. So it may start in um, electronic devices and then go into computers. But then it ends up in things that you would, might not have predicted at all, like photography. Who would have thought? you know, before that happened, that a modern photographic device would be a semiconductor device instead of, you know, chemical device. Um, so, and we've been thinking about this quite a lot in building models, and I think I'm going to skip over this. I, I did a lot of work a long time ago on autocatalytic networks in chemistry, and, um, and I think there's a lot of similarities between autocatalytic networks and technology networks. I'm going to skip through these slides, and uh, and you know, just say that that we certainly aren't the first people to think about the distributed nature of production. The Leontief, who's shown here, um, is a famous model in economics, in which if you're familiar with network type descriptions, nodes are industries, and weighted links are the inputs to the industries, and. Um, we can actually make a precise analogy to chemical kinetics. And so we've been basically building, you know, now he, I have to say, Leontief originally used this for centralized planning of the economy. Um, that is the idea of, let's suppose you're um, Cuba, and you want to get into a given industry. Um, what, do you, what other industries do you need to have in order to support that industry? And how much of it do you need to have? So Leontief originally, uh, his theory was used for that kind of thing. We're trying to make an evolutionary version where instead of using it for centralized planning, we just think about an economy as an evolving thing and, um, and think about the space of technologies as evolving in an evolutionary way. Um, and this is just, by the way, an example of the US Industry Network in 1997 showing you the main components of the US Industry Network in a very fairly coarse-grained way where you see the arrows connecting the industries with the arrows corresponding to the inputs of the industries. Um, 
So I'm going to kind of skip through some of the stuff because I think I don't want to go into too much detail here. And, um, and I'd like to end, just say the other thing we're looking at is patents. The US patent uh, record is a rather remarkable archaeological record in that um, there's data all the way back to 1790. There's the order of 9 million patents. During that period, we go from uh, the patents are classified using technology codes. There could be more than one technology code on a patent. And there were 10,000 technology codes when the classification system was post, first imposed in uh, the, the, like 1825 and um, 1830, maybe. And there's now 150,000 technology codes. So you have this remarkable record of a certain slice of technological progress um, uh, that the U.S. Patent Office has done a lot of work to help make some sense out of them. And so we're using this not because we're so much interested in patents per se, we're interested in having an, um, an archaeological record as we view patents as fossils. And so we've been looking at things like when the two technologies or when the two technological codes occur together in patents, and what does this tell you about patents, and developing classification schemes. And what we see here is that if you look, these are dates along the x-axis here. And these are um, the same dates along the y-axis. And we just ask, we, we do a classification of the technologies in decade by decade. And then we use a similarity measure to ask, how similar are these technologies to each other? And what we see is there's some evidence of a kind of block structure where there are epics where things do not change as much, and then you see sudden shifts and you see other kinds of changes. This, this is due to Giannis Sadakis. Here's another slide due to Giannis Pijin Yun. These are both postdocs at IF. And here's a different approach to doing this using community dynamics. And what you see is initially the Computing dynamics are all over the place, so we're back here at the beginning, and then decade by decade again, but they stabilize over time, and you can actually understand how these interactions are going. And she actually has a tool she'll eventually release where you can click on these bubbles and see what's inside the bubbles. It's very cool. Um, and here's a kind of very stylized picture of the photovoltaic technology ecosystem. We actually have a grant from the US Department of Energy to study photovoltaics and help them try and understand what are the influences on, tech, on photovoltaic technological progress. Um, so uh, I think on this, I'm going to end on this last slide here. Just to get you to think a little bit about what an amazing thing our economy is and how interlinked everything in the economy is. Suppose that all technology were destroyed, but Except we had a library with all the explicit knowledge. That is, we have all the books. All, all you know, Oxford libraries are still there. And um, let's suppose we even still have all the tacit knowledge. So we have some group of technicians that, um, and uh, you know, lawyers and so on, because that's an important kind of technology too. So we have we have some. So think of them as priests. You know, they're left behind to try and um, get things going again. And even to make it simple, let's suppose you give them a century's worth of freeze-dried food so they don't have to start foraging right away. They can spend 100 years focusing on trying to reboot the economy. Um, now, how would you do that, first of all? It, could they even do it in 100 years? Um, I think it would be quite difficult, actually. And <clears throat> when you think about it, one of the main reasons it's so difficult is because everything depends on everything else. Think about something as simple as a screw. Basic component you need to put things together. Well, how do you make screws? Well, you have to first go smelt metal. How do you smelt the metal? Well, you're going to have to go back, because we destroyed all the technology. They're going to have to you know, make a stone axe, and you know, stone shovels, and dig for a long time. You get the metal out of the ground, and uh, build fires, and figure out how to get the fires hot enough to smelt it, not to go back and look because tricks for making fires hot, you know, or a lot of old, in many cases, lost information. Um, and that's just, you know, we have centuries of stuff that would have to be recapitulated just because everything depends so much on everything else and it depends 
It's an autopilot process where it's there because it's there because it's there. It's there because the other stuff is there that allowed you to make it. And so I think this just underscores the kind of um, intense codependence we have in the economy that's the thing that allows us to live in a world where our food supply is fairly regular and you know we can stay warm easily and so on. So on that note, I think I'll end and maybe we can have a good discussion. Thanks. So what's your plan for a Carrington event type? A, a Carrington event? Yeah. Talk, I should know what that, what is a Carrington event? Oh, it's like a solar flare that EMP is the whole world. Right? Oh. That happened in the 1830s, something like that. Yeah. So the solar, the solar flare did what in the 1800s? Oh, it just like fried all the telegraph lines. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're asking me what do I think might do that? Yeah, I mean, you know. Like, I, no, I, no, 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 I'm just saying like you have canned food and, uh, you know, stem shovel. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, in doing this, I, I actually, maybe I ought to think a little bit more about that. I, you know, you, you guys are the experts. Yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I don't. I don't. I don't venture any special expertise in that domain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so, just to be clear, your um, predictive method that you're describing yeah. on technology, technological progress in terms of price, that was where you were saying, okay, it's, it's basically an exponential function, but we're going to add some noise based on a, a statistical model that's parameterized over, say, some arbitrary future. Uh, moving window, so to speak. Is that, is that, have I got that right? Well, I mean, so here, I've re rewritten the You're adding like a noise term. Uh, you, yeah, so yeah. that's the logic. So, that's, so in, this is what's called a geometric random walk. Right. So, this is, so, yeah. so the, the assumption is that y at the next time step is equal to y at the previous time step plus some drift. Yeah. So it's always drift, it's drifting in one direction, plus some noise. Yeah. So the drift ordinarily that would just be like the slope. The drift would be the slope. And if you turn K down to zero, you'd have the, a slope. The noise is based on the historic deviations from right. like that straight line fit. Right. And there's like you got like a statistical okay. So we fit, we assume the the future will be like so that. That gives you a better idea of what potential errors in the future you right. anticipate than just simply continuing the straight line fit. It's, it's right. Well because let me let me yeah. let me rephrase this in a different way. Forecast is a, can be a useful thing, but if I give you a forecast of something, the first question you should ask is, well, how good is that forecast? So if you don't know how good the forecast is, the forecast is close to useless. So what we've done here is we told you, using this very simple method of just linear extrapolation, like, like Gordon Moore used, how good are the forecasts? Yeah. Now, um, I was assuming you haven't got like a singularity. Well, we have, we, the data we have has singularities in it. I want to stress that if you actually go through so our 50 like, data sets. Like if you take a recent example like gas, so the natural price of ga uh, gas has been going up, and then something with short gas. Yeah. You know, in America. So, so, so let me just tell you. How to choose your window, like yeah. presumably you have to have so, a lot of prior knowledge or something. Like so if you look at that time series over a long span, like I did up here, mm -hmm. that's a little blip. I mean, the cost of gas coming down is just a blip. And on a, on a, wait, sorry, I went past the slide. Wait, is that here. cost or price? Because. Like, well, cost or, or price, okay. Yeah. We prefer to use costs in this business if we can because costs are typically less noisy because price is equal to cost plus markup, right? So when you look at, when you're forced to look at price, there's this other random factor in there that may also be error dependent in the early, earlier eras often Industries can charge higher markups and then competition drives the markups down. Yeah. But you know, markups don't vary through that big a range. So while there is a difference between cost and price, it's not, it's typically not more than a factor of two, and usually a lot less. And so that's not so important. But if you look at this much touted drop in price, I mean, oil prices have varied a bit more than coal prices do here. But oil prices now are roughly what they were in 1890, once you adjust for inflation. So oil prices have been varying around, you know, oil bops between um, $20 a barrel at the bottom and 150 or something at the top. But relative to PV, which has undergone a five factor of 5,000 drop, that's small potatoes. 
So what we can do here, we, can, we are going to forecast those little blips. What we're, going to, what we're forecasting are the longer range trends, which we argue, when you look at something like PV, where the longer range trend is fairly dramatic, or pretty good. I mean, PV is photovoltaic, solar energy has been coming down at 9% per year over the span of time, actually faster than that earlier on. So, yeah. Question? Um, I'm just wondering about some of the underlying structural differences that cause the different rates of change, technological change. So you talk a bit about interconnectedness, but are there some other differences between industries and between societies, like the yeah. patent system and the media freedom or whatever? Yeah, so th this is a fascinating question that's not well understood. Um, there, the, 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 the best work I know on this is by um, Chris McGee and Jeffrey Funk. And, um, and they've looked at, they, they point out, I think, there is, is something very, fairly special about semiconductors. Um, you had a case where, in, in the case of semiconductors, where just by making something smaller, you had a triple win. So if you made it smaller, it automatically went faster, and it automatically used less power, and it automatically got cheaper. So all you had to do was take this thing and say, let's just make them smaller and smaller. And all of those three things happen at once. And we've been riding that train for 60 years now. Um, so um, there are other instances where you can have no economies of scale by making things bigger. Like chemical plants, for example, there's a pretty simple um, area to volume ratio. If you ask, I'm going to build a bigger plant, and you look at the cost of building the plant to produce a given amount of chemical because the um, area of material that you need is going up as a square and the volume that you can produce is going up as a cube, you actually can show that you get white swallow the next one of about 0.6 for, for chemicals. And so, um, so there are these, these, these kind of effects. But these are intrinsic to the material that you're dealing with. I'm talking about structural things that public policy could improve or something like that. Like, uh, what would you advise leaders to change in order to accelerate? Well, in this case, what I would advise is, you know, um, think about the fact that if we go back to, and I, I had a slide in here, but I guess I, I, I didn't put in this version, but solar and photovoltaic energy, because it's coming down so fast, investments into it, if they can accelerate that invest, that speed, it doesn't take a large relative deviation in the rate of change to have quite a large effect in how fast we reach crossover and in changing the present value. That is, you know, my prediction is by, and this is why I think maybe it's a positive thing to say about global warming. I think by 2050, solar and photovoltaic is going to make energy very cheap. And um, so we'll be generating energy in a way that's both quite cheap and environmentally quite sound. And uh, um, and so, given that, I mean, for, and for reasons that are mysterious, I mean, you might think nuclear power ought to be coming down too, but the evidence just doesn't show it happening. And, you know, this is true for the U.S. data, it's true for the French data. There have not been any really significant drops in costs for nuclear power. So, um, investments at the margin can make a difference because when you invest in technologies, the more you invest, the cheaper it gets, the better it gets. Yeah. I'm serious on you about improvement taking place at random. I'm aware of many examples, like lead was added to petrol supposedly because of a physics calculation, but turned out to be quite randomly helpful for other reasons. Sure. I know of many instances like that. How serious are you about it well, being no better than random evolution? Yeah, I mean, there's other famous examples like penicillin and so forth, too. Um, um, but, well, I guess... No, I think obviously having a, a designer adds a lot because a designer um, influences the fluctuations that get made and, um, and so I think it makes a big difference in accelerating the rate. So I think there's a big difference in improvement rates as a result of having an intelligent designer. On the other hand, having designed a lot of stuff myself for my own career, what you see is there's an awful lot of trial and error in getting something right. It's an iterative process. You do have to go through these steps where you try something, you have an idea, you try it, you test it. Uh, 
Often it doesn't work. You go back to the drawing board, you try something again, and you profit from what you learned along the way. And of course, if somebody else does something better, you go uh, take a close look at what they're doing and incorporate it. So um, there's, there's a lot of randomness in that search process. Um, I don't want to imply that it's as bad as, I mean, let me say this differently. If you think about theory of optimization, how much you can optimize something, how efficiently you can find an optimum, depends on how much structure there is in the search space. So if you have a nice, smooth search space, you can find an optimum very fast. If you have a rugged landscape, you have to go a lot slower because you get stuck in local minima and you have to deal with the fact that there's structure on different scales. And if you have a needle in a haystack, you just have to look through every piece of straw until you find a needle. And so, and so in that kind of case, if, if, if you were stuck with a really hard technology problem, if it were like a needle in a haystack, Mook's model, Mook was really using the needle in a haystack model. Okay? The right model is closer to a fairly rugged landscape where things get stuck in local maxima and they have to get knocked out. And actually that's what we're doing right now with green growth supports with energy because ultimately I think it's my belief is that solar photovoltaic sits at a lower maximum but you have to get it there. And to get it there you have to deal with the fact that until it's cheaper at the margin people will always invest in something else. So you somehow have to find niches for it to bring it down its curve as to use it enough to and, and do enough R&D and development to figure out how to make it cheap. And, and so you see, we, we somewhat had that from, you know, you went from satellites to, you know, polar research stations to villages in Africa to, you know, things people have on their light posts out in their garden and so forth. But supports have undoubtedly played an important role and carbon tax will probably be a defining thing. But in the long run, you win because if you want to think about the technological landscape, you're stuck in some local maximum or minimum if you think about the cost. And we bang it and knock it out of there, and then it goes to somewhere that's even deeper. So I think society's going to reconfigure its energy generation over the next 30 years, and we'll actually end up in a better place than where we are now as a result of getting knocked out of the rut that we're sitting in, of the local minimum. Did that answer your question? Uh, pretty much, yes. Um, I can think of examples where industries have had to change, for example, chemical processes they're using because of regulations like safety change. And then they discovered that the new method was cheaper, so they would have sat stuck, even though that was not the intent to find a cheaper process, they would have sat stuck in a bad old way forever. So one of the best examples is um, synthetic rubber, where, um, you know, in World War II, Back in World War II, tires were still made of rubber from trees. And the Japanese captured Malaya and the whole part of the world where rubber is mainly produced. So in addition to scrambling to see if we could produce rubber in South America, um, the US, well, uh, Britain, had a massive campaign to try and figure out how to make synthetic rubber tires, synthetic rubber. And within 11 months, new processes had been invented and all the trucks coming off the out of, the fact, out of the assembly line had synthetic rubber tires. So and now nobody would dream of making tires out of natural rubber. Synthetic rubber is a lot better for tire than natural rubber. But it's another good example where as a result of getting banged, you know, the, the disturbance forced industry to do something different and it turned out to be a lot better. There are many such examples actually. Yeah. So I know like with the Tom Douglas function, some people just take that and slap it on the technology. Like they just have another one for technology instead of health. Right. That's pretty much what and, endogenous growth theory is about. Right. And and so I guess my question is you're you're saying that there are these instances in which investment actually has like a huge payoff in terms of technological development. And so um, I guess I was curious like how dramatically different those coefficients are. Well, I don't really know how to I mean, think about that in these terms yet, although I'm working on this. Right. This is an open question, because the state of the art in endogenous growth theory is that this number is a scalar, but it's made a function of time, right. and then there's some dynamics for how it changes as a function of time. Um, but we're trying to get a better understanding, and, and, and this per se, I mean, we're actually trying to think about input-output matrices, and why is it that photovoltaics are behaving so differently than these other technologies. Um, 
but we don't have that well put together, to be honest. Yeah? Is it maybe the case that um, we see, if, if we go back even, even further, like towards like 1780s and the development of the steam engine, that we see that dramatic drop in the efficiency of coal, or the increase in the efficiency of coal? And that's kind of what we're seeing, because you don't have that time and data there, like that's kind of... Um, yeah, so you're asking if we went back earlier, would yes. we see coal, uh, yeah, similar coal getting to cheaper, yeah. or coal getting more expensive if you go far enough back? Yes. Far enough back, probably it does. Yeah. Um, um, I'm actually trying to track that data down to see. Mm -hmm. um, this is really coal, I mean by... 60, 1860, which is I think the first data point we have here, okay. coal was already a fairly widespread commodity. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the industrial age, I mean, the, the steam age went on for quite a long time after that. Yeah. So we are capturing a significant part of the steam age. Okay. But it, you know, it is, the, the remarkable thing about this to me is that if you think about it, back in that day, coal was mined by guys with shovels, mm -hmm. right, in little carts that they wheeled up to the surface. And, um, and the big innovation was actually, actually put back about here when Newcomen brought in the steam engine to pump out coal mines. Pump, steam engine was invented, the Newcomen engine was invented to pump water out of coal mines. And so ironically. Yeah. And okay, by here we had Watt and steam engines had gotten a lot better. And, but, but over here, you know, coal mining is a very sophisticated technological operation. They take whole mountains in West Virginia and knock the top off of them and process all the coal in a very automated way. And yet, at least once you adjust for inflation, it's about the same. Of course, adjusting for inflation, you have to remember that you're, the whole, you're in a coal moving reference frame for the whole, the average rate of technological improvement. So when you're in that coal moving reference frame, it doesn't seem like it's gotten much cheaper. But in contrast, PDs operating in a different way, as are transistors and gene sequencing and several other technologies are in a completely different domain than these other these older technologies are. Well thank you guys. You're a good audience, I appreciate it. Thanks.